So I am now joined by Aziz Rana. Aziz is a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute and professor of law at Cornell University. He's the author of the book, The Two Faces of American Freedom, and he's also currently finishing a book on the history of constitutional veneration. How's it going, Aziz? Great to be here. Thanks so much for, for having me on. Happy to have you. Uh, so you make what I think is a fairly straightforward and powerful case in a recent article in Descent called Left Internationalism in the Heart of Empire, uh, as well as in some earlier pieces uh, regarding how Americans should think about a global working class, our universal political demands, and what present challenges are uh, to achieve them. Um, so could you maybe just start with how Americans broadly have understood internationalism, maybe kind of the dominant mainstream understanding of internationalism, and then contrast that with how the left has understood internationalism and maybe what it should mean now? Sure. Uh, so, you know, for I'd say pretty much the last century, certainly since the 1940s, there's been a pretty clear way that American elites and then the public generally has thought about the American project, which is that the American project is essentially grounded in a commitment to liberty and equality, that this means domestically its institutions, whether it's representative institutions or even its system of market capitalism, is generally consistent with just outcomes and the inclusion of all. And that means that what the U.S. supports abroad is really the promotion of these bedrock universal commitments. And so its interests are more or less the world's interests. Now, there's a recognition that there's histories of sexism, of racism, of class inequality. But the thought is that this really doesn't go to the heart of the national project. There, you know, there are problems that the country's in the process of overcoming. And mm -hmm. so when the U.S. pursues various kinds of practices overseas, it's promoting its essence rather than these problematic uh, aspects of it. There's mm -hmm. also a recognition that internationally, sometimes the U.S. gets things wrong. So, you know, even disastrously so in the context of Vietnam or the Iraq invasion. But these are exceptions and that by and large, American foreign policy is, you know, is a project that that's aiming at creating a stable, pacific, prosperous world order. And what all of that ends up justifying is a version of what you can think of as liberal internationalism that defines the national security states project. The thought mm -hmm. is that the U.S., because of this, rightly enjoys an international police power that it has the authority to intervene everywhere around the world, especially when they're hotspots. The thought is that for a stable system of international order, there has to be some dominant state that has the authority to, to intercede and maybe even to move inside or outside of the rules to ensure that the rules as a whole are being followed. And that all of this ends up more or less falling to the U.S., and that this is justified. If anything, that suggests that the, the state project and the security state is a kind of agent moving the world in better directions. So that's the basic approach. It's what most people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And there's been a sustained, really, left critique of it. And the left critique goes something like this, which is, well, at the heart of the security project has been a specific combination of corporate and military elites. And this means that primarily during the Cold War period, but also after the Cold War, that the set of interests that have been promoted have not necessarily been the interests of those that are most marginalized, either mm -hmm. elsewhere in terms of what their actual self, the, the actual self-determination of local communities might be, or marginalized communities domestically. And this is why the long history of American primacy of the quote unquote American century has been a history of sustained interventions, coups, assassinations across the world in ways that suggest that rather than rule following, it's really been violence and lawlessness under the guise of rule following that's oftentimes been the product of American action. And that over mm -hmm. the long run, rather than global prosperity, a lot of what American primacy has ended up promoting is the accumulation of wealth domestically for specific kinds of elites through the benefits of dollar hegemony and American global economic standing, the construction of frameworks in which you have sharp divides between friends and foes, where wealth is accumulated and assets are provided to friends, and then foes find themselves in this kind of either-or world of being immiserated or fa facing various forms of intervention and overthrow. Mm -hmm. 
And so the response from left activists, and you can see this within anti-colonial struggles, within um, labor and, um, and radical workers movements, is that in order for there to be a genuine internationalism that's committed to treating the global commons as a universal resource and redistributing global wealth in ways that are non-exploitative, not grounded in dependency, and organized through true local self-determination, that Americans at home have to really commit to the idea that you have an independent foreign policy that's distinct from the objectives of the security state. Mm -hmm. And that this independent foreign policy instead is organized through transnational commitments that link together workers as well as colonized peoples everywhere and see the relevant networks of community as not between, let's say, a worker and a powerful co-national who might share none of the same interests, but as between genuine sites that share common interests right. in constructing an alternative framework. Yeah, I, I, that's, I think, very clear. And, and I think you make a very strong case for that. A lot of what's so refreshing about your argument is how rooted it is within thinking about power, thinking about capacity of the left, uh, of workers, and um, I guess the organized left, the organized coming through institutions, coming through means that actually can uh, achieve power. Um, you make an interesting point about how the weakness of American left internationalism has to do largely, or at least to some extent, with the collapse of left internationally focused institutions globally, uh, especially in the global south. Can you explain what those institutions were and why we no longer have them? Sure. I mean, so if we just took a snapshot of politics, let's say, in the 1960s and 1970s, one of the things that would feel very different by comparison with the present is that you'd have all of these different liberation and anti-colonial organizations around the world. So you can think of, you know, things like the, the ANC, but well beyond the ANC, that there's just a number of different anti-colonial liberation groups, and that these organizations are also connected in various ways to organizations domestically in the U.S. And you can see this as everything from SNCC to the Panthers to a variety of different kinds of left institutions. Mm -hmm. And then alongside that, you had a first generation of independence leaders. So this is, you know, Nereri in Tanzania, Manly um, in Jamaica, and many others that are trying to think about, well, how to house alternative international arrangements. So uh, Adam Getachew is a terrific scholar who's written about the new international economic order, which was an effort to think about a multipolar regionalism that reconceived the global commons on grounds that were non-exploitative and that rejected the forms of dependency that marked economic frameworks. And that all of this provided an entrenched framework for having conversations across borders about, you know, how to deal with everything from security uh, hotspots that arise to broader frameworks around, you know, what to make of political economy. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, weaker than it was earlier in the century, you still had, uh, you know, a strong foundation of a global labor movement, mm -hmm. where very closely tied with these anti-colonial institutions were the institutions of global labor that played a central role in mass organization against uh, imperialism and colonialism, but that also linked together and stitched together folks on grounds of shared class solidarity, and that had its own century-long history that could sort of proceed back even before the Cold War to think about how workers had been connected across different parts of the world in transnational alliances that offered, again, an alternative framework to what the state provided. So that was a very different way of thinking about how the left was situated, and it was organized through a real infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that happens over the last half century is really the sustained pushback against this entire infrastructure mm -hmm. for reasons that have to do both with the internal weaknesses within left um, internationalism, but then also with, you know, the, the way in which uh, American and Western security apparatuses engaged. So internal weaknesses. Unfortunately, and this is something that, you know, really you can't romanticize on the left, that many of those first generation independence leaders ended up instituting forms of authoritarianism and plutocracy, mm 
that really broke um, elements of the kind of liberationist imagination. But alongside this problem of real authoritarianism, once you had independence, independent states, excuse me, across large chunks of Asia and Africa, you also had two other significant things that occurred, which is that the security states project in the U.S., along with its various allies, pretty systematically attempted to destroy these networks. And they did so mm -hmm. through assassinations, coups, overthrows, destabilizing non-aligned socialist and left institutions and governments. And that's, I think, a significant way to think about the interventionist politics during the Cold War, and even, frankly, in various ways after the Cold War that marked American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And then alongside that, you had a basic economic vision that the U.S. and European countries pursued that was the direct opposite of ideas like the new international economic order that was instead really premised on footloose and transnational corporate property rights, the expansion of market access, you know, privatization. And so these kinds of policies of neoliberal austerity effectively went hand in hand with really a dramatic global assault on the institutions of labor and mm -hmm. on sort of the, the, the kind of class foundations of left international politics. So but that by the time we get to 2022, you neither have the old kind of liberation organizations, mm -hmm. many of the states that ended up replacing those organizations in the global south ended up succumbing to various forms of capitalist authoritarianism. You had a sustained security crackdown on the actual actors that were involved in the transnational left. And you had a global economy that was built on undermining effectively the power of global labor so that the infrastructure that fed class alliances, transnational solidarities, and an alternative way of thinking about the global commons was also essentially profoundly compromised. And all that's left really as the folks that engage in conversation when it comes to national security and foreign policy are the security states across these various places, not just in the US and Europe, but also in the global south, which are security states that are oftentimes deeply aligned with the interests of the US, or even when they're not deep, not aligned, are themselves variants of an authoritarian capitalism. Mm -hmm. And those are the only relevant agents when it comes to engaging with questions of foreign policy. Yeah. Well, so actually, I think it's worth maybe looking at how uh, left internationalism, kind of left anti-imperialism, has thought about these things, uh, the, the people who actually, you know, uh, think about this and, and write about this and, and make these arguments and kind of the general tenor on on the American left, certainly. Um, and I think part of that problem is that a lot of uh, American internationalism and anti-imperialism is kind of just what I call, and I'm picking this up from someone else, I'm stealing someone else's term, but kind of like a vulgar anti-imperialism that uh, it basically just redounds to American empire is big and bad. It's really big. It's everywhere. has a ton of money. And it's really bad. Uh, whenever, you know, something horrible happens in the world, uh, you can probably suspect that it's American empire afoot, that it's American empire is the, the thing that is intervening. And, um, and therefore, that when there are, uh, you know, uh, conflicts or, or revolts around the world, it's all kind of in terms of them versus the American empire. Um, I'm being very general right now, you know, obviously, but I do think there's kind of a, a general thrust um, to a lot of kind of American anti-imperialism that kind of takes this this tone. Um, and obviously, I think, uh, Aziz, you and I would agree with a good deal of, of that, in, insofar as at least the spirit of the fact that yeah, actually, obviously, uh, the American empire is real, and it does actually have horrible consequences for many, many people around the world, including people domestically. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, I think part of the problem with that analysis is it ends up flattening the world. And maybe more egregious, it actually ends up hiding or uh, kind of erasing American, or not just American, but erasing capitalism, that it, it basically gets rid of class distinctions, and it sees the world in terms of nations and nation states. Whereas, you know, it's not that America 
invaded Iraq. It's the military. It's the American military. It's the American political class. It's the American ruling class. Uh, you know, the same thing with what's going on in with the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's not Russia. There is no such thing as Russia. There's the Russian ruling class. There's the Russian political elite that are doing this. And then the Russian working class uh, are suffering under an authoritarian country. Um, and so I think part of this, um, you know, you make you part of what you say in the, the article um, is like, you know, moving away from uh, the left's kind of more moralistic international outlook. Um, uh, part of, you know, part of doing that or, or part of the problem or like why it's difficult to move past kind of this like framework and this kind of moralistic uh, outlook has to do with the fact that we don't have a political agent, um, that there's this uh, problem when you see something horrible happen in the world. Um, it's very easy to either say, you know, you support what, you know, the American government's doing or you are doing nothing, that there really isn't any alternative because the left doesn't actually have any agent to actually carry out our politics. Um, could you maybe speak a little bit more about the importance of having an agent, a political agent of the left, and what it would do if we had one? Sure. Do, do you mind if I first just sort of make a point <laughs> about um, about sort of the the more conventional versions of anti-imperialism Please. that yeah. circulate I in American I, politics. I, I threw a lot in there. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can talk about that first. Yeah. And then, I, you know, let's discuss a little bit about the effects of not having a coherent agent or really set of like, a set of overlapping institutions and infrastructure like yeah. what might have existed half a century ago. Sure. So, you know, American anti-imperialism, the one that you're probably most that folks are most familiar with, in many ways is a product of the end of the Cold War. And it's a product of what I think was and still is an incredibly important intervention that started to develop really in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And basically, with the end of the Cold War, you had folks that were, you know, across the bipartisan political establishment and, abs and certainly connected to the national security state that were increasingly making the argument that American security politics has no political character. Where, you know, in the during the Cold War period, there's this confrontation between capitalism and socialism. There's this ideological struggle. The thought now was that in a unipolar world, the political character of American foreign policy disappears because really all you have is the U.S. as a site of rule protection and the rest of the world as sites of disorder and humanitarian harm. Mm -hmm. And what the U.S. does when it intervenes, when it engages in airstrikes, when it imposes harsh sanctions, what it's really doing is it's going after rogue states and it's engaged in a kind of moral imperative to protect the world. Now, mm -hmm. the truth is that the post-Cold War era of unipolarity, precisely because this was the underlying agenda effectively behind the national security state, became one of sustained American rule defection. Mm -hmm. The very rules that it was premised to uphold ended up being rules that it systematically violated based on the idea that it had this exceptional status and that it had no political agenda beyond, you know, protecting people. Mm -hmm. And what I think a lot of anti-imperial analysis was about and has been about is to say, well, wait a second. No, that's not the case. There is a political agenda that drives the national security state's framework and that this idea of moral innocence really is compromised by the sustained forms of lawlessness, rule breaking and violence that various forms of American interventionism has imposed. Mm -hmm. That the combination of the security state's, you know, overarching grand strategy, whether having access to oil or backing destructive regional allies like Saudi Arabia or Israel in the Middle East, or promoting its own market interests, these were bound to sort of to produce negative consequences and feedback loops both internationally and at home. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that, you know, in 2022, the structure of American polarity, in large part because of the ways in which the U.S. is engaged in various forms of defection, is really starting to break down. And we're starting to see new kind of incipient forms of multipolarism. In other words, strong alternative states with their own projects like China, like Russia, that in many ways 
you know, are, if not full on competitors, but are also engaging on the world stage. And the natural response, if the analysis that's critical of American empire is a product really of the 90s and the 2000s, is to say, well, multipolarism is good. We want to not have a unipolar world marked by American primacy. And that's certainly my position as well. I think, you know, an ideal global outcome is a multipolar world in which communities on the ground actually are the ones that are able to make the decisions about how to organize the global commons. Mm -hmm. But the version of multipolarism that we're starting to see emerge right now is not that emancipatory one. It's mm -hmm. a version of multipolarism where you still have this very powerful hegemon in the U.S. that lurches from circumstance to circumstance with no real clarity, with a dysfunctional domestic institutional process marked by growing de-democratization and a global set of policies, aggressive sanctions, militarized confrontation that are really destructive. And you can see this play out in Afghanistan, Libya. Um, you can certainly see it in the response to the pandemic, which is thoroughly scrambled and incoherent. And on the other side, you have these authoritarian capitalist states that are multipolar sites of regional authority, but whose projects are also not emancipatory and are in many ways shaped by the transformations in the global order of the last half century that really undermined the institutions of the left. And in this context, it can be really easy to sort of fall into the tendency to just sort of see what the U.S. is doing and criticize it without clearly and comprehensively articulating what Bassam Haddad has called and what I mentioned in the, the piece, an approach that combines anti-authoritarianism and anti-imperialism everywhere, regardless of which site or space it's emanating from. Mm -hmm. um, so now I guess that gets to the question about, about you know, why some of the problems we see present when it comes to the American left is a function of not having a clear agent. Should I just talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I, I think just on, on your last point, though, uh, about, you know, I, I, I totally agree with what you've just said. I think, it, and it, again, I think you make a very compelling case here and in the article. Um, and, and again, I think part of that, you know, what the left should be thinking about is, yes, we're anti-authoritarian, but part of that is insofar as we're trying to select a better enemy to go up against. We'd rather go up against, you know, liberal democratic capitalists rather than authoritarian, brutal dictators that uh, don't have limitations imposed on them. Um, and I think part of the, you know, the challenge of having left internationalism historically has been, you know, I, again, identifying the fact that in capitalism, the cleavage is between workers and capitalists, the exploited and exploiters. And that's true whether it's white people, brown people, the US, Europe, anywhere else in the world, the global south, that um, this has been a, a challenge, I think, also for uh, anti-colonial and uh, national liberation movements um, that, you know, there's been a diversity of anti-colonial and, and uh, liberation and uh, national liberation movements in how they've approached this question of basically nationalism and to the extent to which they see some alliance with their ruling class against the U.S. versus seeing the ruling class as their primary first first and foremost enemy, uh, you know, insofar as trying to create a society that actually is, you know, to the benefit of working people around the world in all of these countries. Um, and now that certainly in the 21st century, we're living in a global capitalist world. The, the, there's only pockets of non-capitalist uh I'm excluding China for a moment here <laughs> when we don't have to figure out what China is exactly. But the point is just that the world is overwhelmingly capitalist. Uh, and so the confrontation remains, you know, those who are exploited and those who exploit. Uh, and it's within a highly unequal world, obviously. Uh, I don't know. How, how would, how, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm asserting so, I mean, a claim. I, I, but... Yeah, I totally agree with the point that you're making, which is yeah. part of the story, too, about the containment of the global labor movement, which was truly, you know, in the latter part of the 19th century, across much of the 20th century, a transnational movement of worker mm -hmm. solidarity with really thick institutions across borders, mm -hmm. as well as the containment of anti-colonial politics, right. um, is that 
essentially the lefts across the world, to the extent that they exist, have become trapped by the national borders. They're trapped mm -hmm. within national borders and they're contained within the context of domestic politics. That there's this really sharp divide, perhaps we'll get to this, between domestic mm -hmm. and foreign. And it also then reproduces very specific tendencies. It, it essentially helps disappear the background dynamics of global capitalism and how that is infused with dynamics of empire. Mm -hmm. And it transforms most conversations about foreign policy into exchanges just with the national security state. The national right. security state is the relevant actor, and that's who you're in conversation with. Rather than thinking about, well, you know, honestly, the security apparatus in the US and the security apparatus even of American foes, let alone allies, have a lot more in common in terms of the way that they're constructed, mm -hmm. their, con their presentation of uh, perceived enemies, their use of counterterrorism tools against domestic dissidents, their linkages within global networks of power. I mean, even think about a country like Iran, which mm -hmm. has been framed very clearly as an American enemy. You know, it's a deeply concerned, when we think about it in terms of political economy, and I'm, I'm not an Iran expert, so I might be opening myself up, but I would say <laughs> that, you know, the government wants to be part, it seems like, wants to be part of global networks of capital. It's yeah. not presenting an alternative account of economic organization that would be consistent with an emancipatory vision. That there's, a, there's all of these continuities that have been shaped. But you're right, like the focus on the nation means that the only way that we think of these relevant conversations is not between communities that are transnational, stitched mm -hmm. by common interest and class experience or anti-colonial experience, but rather by like, you know, nation state objective and grand strategy and rivalry, you know, the, the Henry Kissinger approach to the world. And, you know, this, I think, has real consequences when we think about um, this issue of the lack of transformative agents, agents mm -hmm. when it comes to foreign policy debates, yeah. where, you know, one of the things I think has really been telling about the last year in American foreign policy is that if you think about it, if you just sort of take a step back, not just the last year, the last decade. The U.S. is basically in the security apparatus is lurching from strategic failure to strategic failure. Mm -hmm. You know, everything from the global financial crisis to the Iraq and Afghanistan wars and the pullouts to, you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. And yet in the context, for instance, of events in in Ukraine and Russia's imperial invasion of Ukraine, it's really been the left that's been on the defensive mm -hmm. and the left that seemed fractured where you know, there's been a rallying around effect effectively within the Democratic Party around what the security state says and does. And that even though that security state is then, you know, essentially applying oftentimes a lot of the same basic, you know, policy frameworks that I think are deeply troubling, which is the, the same conventional toolkit of aggressive sanctions, milita militarized confrontation mm -hmm. um, across all of these different settings, it's as if in each circumstance, the only example of what doing something means is tied to that state. And left accounts are the ones that seem really fractured and internally in conflict. And I'd say, you know, not the only reason, but a significant part of this is that the, the, the sort of the, de the destruction and um, pushback against demobilization effectively of transnational left institutions Mm -hmm. combined with the containment of lefts within the nation state means that when it comes to foreign policy in particular, foreign policy is generally in the U.S. articulated not by movements, not by mobilized publics, not mm -hmm. in the context of power building. It's articulated instead by individuals, whether folks like me, frankly, that are just, you know, academics that don't really have a connection to underlying social movements or various other kinds of activists or journalists that are similarly individuals that are speaking on their own. Mm -hmm. They're not part of, you know, large scale movement organizations, party infrastructures, um, union infrastructures that have these transnational connections. Mm -hmm. And it's rarely the case that the individuals that are also talking have any kind of sustained interaction with folks that are on the left in the country where, where wherever the, the, the hot spot is. In other words, the national security states, even the opposed security states, are in continuous conversation mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, Biden, Boris Johnson, Merkel, uh, Zelensky, Putin, they, they're repeat players that are in sustained conversation and so are shaping a specific kind of world. Right. Where oftentimes, whenever there's a perceived crisis, for the left contained as it is and framed around individual reactions, it's, it's the first time, effectively, that left intellectuals that are talking about foreign policy are really in conversation, or not, frankly, in conversation with left um, intellectuals, institutions in these other countries. Mm-hmm. And all of that creates a tendency to say, well, then the approach is basically going to be individuals pushing back against just what the U.S. is doing. But also, it's very hard to create something like common frameworks, to to have spaces where people across these different country and institu- institutional spaces, in other words, you know, transnationally, come together to work through what an alternative would be. Like, what if you had a genuine left government in the U.S.? What should mm-hmm. its response be? to a, a, a Russian imperial invasion. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have any of that infrastructure, and all you have instead is sort of individuals that don't in fact represent underlying social bases. And that produces a real fracture and, fracture and discord that then feeds into the idea that the national security state's approach is the only relevant approach because it's the only one with the sustained inst- institutions and like capacity as an agent to actually intervene. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's your kind of the next question I wanted to get into is directly dealing with this. And and maybe we've already somewhat answered it. But um, this is you bring this up in your piece. We've thought about this, uh, you know, both uh, in the web version of of Jacobin, but also in video um, where, you know, when we look at the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there's something of a tension when we're in our discussions where it seems like on the one hand, we're talking about, you know, what should the U.S. government be doing? How should it handle this situation versus what would be the left's response if it was in power? Um, and obviously those are fairly different. You know, the limitations of uh, you, you take into account, you know, that, you, you know, to what extent can we actually even influence the U.S. government right now in its decisions? And is that really why we're making these interventions? Are we saying, you know, we should be pushing for the U.S. government to be doing X uh, or is it an exercise in understanding, well, if we were in this position, if the U.S. left uh, was in power, uh, how would we handle the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Um, and I think there's something of a tension there, but I think you also address how in, in some ways it's it, there's actually a fairly straightforward way of dealing with that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is this is precisely the balancing act. Mm-hmm. that left domestically has to engage in precisely because of its systematic and historic exclusion from power, mm-hmm. which is to the extent that the national security state's framework is the only one on the table, then that's going to essentially drive conversation. And in order to be able to ensure that that's not the case, or at least begin the process by which that's not the case, you actually have to have credible left alternatives about how you'd exercise state power under these particular kinds of circumstances. And so you need to present a credible alternative, but then highlight, too, how the approach of the security state systematically, time and again, produces deleterious outcomes. So, you know, in the context of Ukraine, my own position is that a a commitment to anti-colonial self-determination means that you have to impose oppose imperial invasion of one country by another. Mm-hmm. And I think that justifies, in, in this context, defensive military assistance, but defensive military assistance that's really combined with a commitment to diplomacy, so de-escalation, mm-hmm. that if you're going to engage in sanctions that are very narrowly targeted against those that are actually engaged in sort of Russian aggression. So opposing broad ranging sanctions regime that, uh, you know, proceed through what amounts to collective punishment. And that if you're going to go after Russian oligarchs, again, that has to be a global project, which is an important global project of closing tax havens, uh, attacking oligarchs everywhere rather than just exclusively Russian oligarchs. Mm -hmm. And then all of that has to be tied to a theory 
of solidarity that's built around not just humanitarian assistance, necessary humanitarian assistance in Ukraine, but also uh, global humanitarian assistance, given the fact that, as the UN Secretary General has said, 1.7 billion people around the world are facing, as a, in partly as a result of the war and the sanctions approach the U.S. is engaged in, uh, crises when it comes to food, mm-hmm. energy, um, finances, and that there's clearly money to be able to provide the kinds of redistributive needs that the that the world currently is struggling with in the context even of these kinds of conflicts. So that you could imagine what a left alternative approach would be that takes seriously principles of anti-imperialism and anti-authoritarianism. That's not what the U.S. is doing. Right. The U.S. is combining, um, you know, a commitment to sort of rejecting Russian aggression but with its geostrategic objectives. And those geostrategic objectives are tied to weakening a global adversary. And that, that that framework is part of why we have the same conveyor belt of policies that are being imposed yet again. You know, wide ranging and fairly extreme s- sanctions approach that are having really destructive effects on ordinary people, both in the context of the specific crisis, but then also around the world. Um, that you know, there's no clear history of these strong sanctions actually producing, generating peaceful outcomes. And then all Mm -hmm. that is tied to really flooding both Europe and the conflict with arms, I think, in ways that promote a kind of militarized intensification that has humanitarian effects for the war. But then if we just take a step back, has real effects for Europe. Mm -hmm. That, you know, a peaceful Europe in my my view is tied to a demilitarized Europe based on collective security, having instead a European context in which, you know, you have heightened militarization in a setting in which, frankly, Trump could be president in the U.S., Le Pen could be in charge Mm -hmm. of France, is a truly dystopian one that seems to ignore the fact that Europe has been facing and the U.S. intense de-democratization too over the last decade. So you could have these hyper-aggressive xenophobic nationalist states all in confrontation with each other um, through a really militarized framework. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, what this means is you have to be able to do both. You have to be able to articulate alternatives, but then highlight how the tendency to combine American security state geostrategic objectives and a conveyor belt of policies over the long run, repeatedly has produced outcomes that are inconsistent with the the stated objectives. And that this is not by chance, this is a function of how the geostrategic commitments to primacy and the policies that have gone hand in hand with those end up undermining, frankly, the kind of, you know, alternative, far more pluralistic, far more uh, globally redistributive Um, world order that I think folks on the left might want or be committed to. But -hmm. you have no choice but to do both of these things. And part of the reason why, frankly, it's so hard to do both of these things at once is because it's essentially isolated, going back to the the previous point, it's essentially isolated individuals. Mm -hmm. And foreign policy, you know, uh, foreign policy elites, experts, Mm -hmm. that are the ones that are trying to stitch together left analysis rather than sustained conversations across borders among groups and movements with representative bases. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's really the foundation for being able to engage in that kind of balancing act. Mm-hmm. So maybe just kind of somewhat to wrap up, or maybe just one last kind of topic to tie all this together. Uh, one of the points that you make in your piece has to do with the fact that in large part, uh, domestic politics seem to be separated from foreign politics, foreign policy, international politics. Um, and in many ways, that's not actually the case. That's why I'm saying it seems like it, or there's the appearance that there's this division, but that the left, uh, maybe more often than not, or more often than it should at least, um, has allowed that separation to be there. And so uh, thinking about you know the questions of how we build social democracy in the US, if, for our, you know, American leftists, as you know, for our American audience, and obviously social democracy around the world. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll get democratic socialism one day. Fingers 
you know, crossed, I guess, but, but, you know, minimally building uh, social democracy uh, and, and public goods that provide, you know, take care of people's needs above and beyond uh, the interests of profitability, that that has to be tied with internationalism uh, and anti-militarism uh, and a peaceful foreign policy. Um, and that in many ways, it's not just that, you know, it should be tied, that they are in fact tied um, and that social democracy really truly goes hand in hand with anti-imperialism um, and that it's actually, you know, it's, a, it's probably maybe the more, the most important question in all this ultimately always is how, how do you do that? How do you get there rather than just saying it should be? Um, and I think that's actually the more politically viable uh, strategy. Um, and, and my sense is uh, from reading your article is that that's your sense as well. So maybe could you talk about uh, how do we marry social democracy and uh anti-imperialism uh, in a practical and strategic way. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the first point to note is the one that you made, which is the long story really of s s uh, center left and, you know, social democratic left politics, mainstream social democratic left politics in the US uh, since the Cold War has been a separation of foreign and domestic. And I think you can see this as part of a kind of, you know, compromise that the labor movement in particular and the civil rights movement as well engaged in in the mid 20th century. So for the labor movement, you know, many of the benefits of the New Deal settlement were organized around the idea that business, labor and government would work together to ensure something like a, a limited social welfare state at home. But part of the condition really for that was that, you know, labor activists re rejected engaging in a kind of general contestation of what the U.S did abroad, so that you cleaved this, uh, the domestic from the foreign. And there was also, I think, a background set of reasons for, for why. So one had to do with, you know, genuine concerns among many folks in the labor movement with the Soviet Union and the authoritarianism of, of Stalin. Mm -hmm. I think another reason really did have to do with the fact that, frankly, empire and social democracy in the mid 20th century seemed to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. That the U.S.'s dollar hegemony, its control over the the global um, financial system, uh, access to foreign markets, all of these things fed domestic prosperity, especially for a white working and middle class. And so it was the case, you could make a plausible argument in the 40s and 50s that for some portion of the American public, that um, social democracy and American primacy were stitched together. Now, the problem was that over the long run, that the objectives of the security state and their close binding to corporate elites ended up really cutting against global labor protections, the global labor movement in general, created a circumstance in which labor was trapped within borders, but capital was footloose and mobile, mm -hmm. and which ended up generating austerity and miseration elsewhere. And then eventually, you know, came back home where the same kinds of sort of footloose realities of, you know, a capital that can move effortlessly, that has strong property rights protections, that that undermines um, labor protections, you know, systematically destroyed um, the labor movement domestically and then had pretty profound effects on sustaining not just the institutions of social democracy at home, but also the experience of material largesse and a rising tide. So that by the time we get again to 2022, we're living in a world in which the idea that American primacy is actually promoting domestic wealth for large segments of the American population, not just those that enjoy the benefits really of corporate power, is really hard to sustain. Mm -hmm. So that there's a kind of loop here where the plausibility of social democracy and empire fitting together really doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that highlights how domestic struggles, domestic struggles over political economy, over class, over the potential for social democracy, swim within the water of global realities. Mm -hmm. And it therefore requires not just these strong transnational institutions, but it also requires thinking about foreign policy beyond if the US is sending a whole bunch of troops to a place like Iraq mm -hmm. as actually a site for movement activism and movement organization, that the foreign and the domestic work together. And so it's one of the reasons why in the piece, you know, I think promoting 
global labor rights, um, decriminalizing the border, significantly uh, cutting back the security budget. Mm -hmm. All of these are good policies, but there are also policies that are essential for the institutional strength of the left at home and abroad and essential for actually making plausible the possibility of building social democracy at home. And I should add, you know, to the extent that this has been a somewhat pessimistic conversation, that there are really incipient sites of a kind of international transnational left in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in a way that just wasn't the case five years ago, 10 years ago, um, 20 years ago. And you can see this both in the form of sol solidaristic actions that take place even if there aren't these thick institutional in, uh, connections. So one can just think about the role of, of the movement for black lives in emphasizing the connections between racial justice in the U.S. and, for instance, the experience of Palestinians in Israel-Palestine mm -hmm. that transformed, frankly, the conversation about Palestine domestically here and the response in the U.S., even in mainstream media, to, you know, Israel's actions in places like Gaza and the highlighting, for instance, of, you know, the Amnesty International report that mm -hmm. speaks to uh, the treatment of Palestinians as a form of apartheid. I mean, that is all mobilized in part because of emergent transnational, international and social movement thinking. And then we have incipient sites of institutional connection, like the fact that Bernie Sanders and um, you know Varoufakis have been talking about a progressive international, and indeed that there's you know institutional organizations like the Progressive International that are attempting to link um, uh, uh, solidaristic efforts within the U.S. and overseas through unions, through peace movements, through various other forms. It's just that this is incipient. It needs to be built, and we're essentially trying to recover a mode of thinking, a mode of politics, and a mode of organizing that has been systematically, you know, broken apart over the course of half a century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think tying back to what we were saying earlier, um, I think maybe one way to, to make sense of this is, in many ways, we think of uh, empire and imperialism and also social democracy in these nationalist terms, in these, in the sense that it's the the U.S. is doing this, Sweden is doing this, Sweden has a welfare state, uh, or you know the U.S. has an empire, and I think in many ways it's flawed insofar as it kind of strips away the class character of these. That American empire, just like men, basically every single empire, has had a class character to it. It is a, a ruling class. Uh, project, uh, you know, expanding and, and spreading empire in the same way that social democracy was built uh, against the interests and the whims of ruling classes, of capitalists, of businesses and elites. Um, and so in many ways, uh, you know, v Vivek Chipper has made this point before, I don't remember exactly where, but that you can see the, the development of the British National Health Service occurring at the same time as the, the collapse of British Empire, that uh, these are not coincidences that actually building the, the British welfare state has a lot to do with, uh, you know, draining the coffers of British Empire. And in, in kind of in a similar way, you make a case in your argument that we should fight for things like Medicare for all uh, jobs programs, infrastructure programs, uh, in part because it's a means of draining U.S. empire. And that in that way, there is a real material interest in having left internationalism of working class internationalism that it's at your expense as a worker that we have as a country, the U.S. has, uh, and again, I'm, I'm deviating from what I'm already saying, from the, the American military's efforts abroad, that that happens at your expense. And then instead, we should all have health care. Every single person in the world should have health care as a human right. Yeah. Can I can I just um, so I. I completely agree, mm -hmm. but I do want to make one caveat sure. that's specific to the American experience. And so this is, in a way, the argument that I um, that I developed in my first book, The Two Faces of American Freedom, that it's, it's still really important to appreciate a difference between, for example, the British Empire and the versions of American imperial power that we've seen. And that's mm -hmm. tied to the fact that the U.S. is historically was grounded as a settler colonial project. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this is significant is because as a matter of both ideas and institutions, that 
a really thick internal account of economic independence, political freedom was grounded in the expropriation of indigenous land and the coercive use of dependent uh, non-settler labor, in particular enslaved black labor. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, through large chunks of American history, this is one way of talking in general, truly general terms about the 18th and 19th century, a version of, if not social democracy, economic populism was tied to empire. It's mm -hmm. a way of thinking about somebody like um, Thomas Jefferson or Andrew Jackson, that the kind of high tides of economic populism were also high tides of what amount to a, a white populism that was racially organized and grounded in territorial conquest and indigenous expropriation. Mm -hmm. It is noteworthy that the, the significant period where you have an internationalist left that's housed within um, you know, white, white politics that's attempting to connect social democracy with anti-imperialism is the late 19th and the early 20th century, which is a period in which that settler project is breaking down as a way of actually providing material benefits mm -hmm. to, um, to most Americans. And what ended up being reconstituted was an account of global primacy and global power. Mm -hmm. And again, in the mid 20th century, in ways that are kind of consistent with the story of settler colonialism, you could make an argument that social democracy, again, was stitched to empire, but now to the idea of the U.S. is enjoying this international police power, the right to intervene everywhere, and that was backstopped by its own economic and military authority. And now, 2022, we're basically witnessed the collapse of that stitching of social democracy and empire. And we have another opportunity. This is another moment to think seriously about whether or not social democracy, democratic socialism can be combined to anti-imperial principles. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes this tough in the U.S. is we don't really have successful historical models of these things fitting together. Mm -hmm. We have very powerful social movements in the past that conceived of their necessity for their long-term durability. And those are the resources that we can draw on, as well as the fact that the current order cannot persist as it is that we're moving toward both domestically and globally, you know, a set of potentially really dystopian outcomes where you have dysfunctional institutions and power that's untethered from law or legitimating ideology. Mm -hmm. And that the only response, both at home and abroad, is to forthrightly conceive of how an anti-imperialism can be bound to social democracy in ways that think of the global commons as a repository for all and of domestic American politics as a site for liberation. Yeah. I'm not sure if we're ending on an optimistic note. It kind of is, but it's also kind of not. It's maybe something uh, somewhere in between. But I, I think it's a very sober and, and useful note. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time, for many, many insights. This is a long conversation. I hope people enjoyed it. Um, again, Aziz Rana is a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute and professor of law at Cornell University. His first book, as he mentioned, is The Two Faces of American Freedom. And uh, be on the lookout for his next book, uh, which, as I mentioned, deals with just our awful constitution and, uh, and its historic veneration. So thank you again, Aziz, uh, and I uh, hope to speak to you again soon. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.